Welcome to Photojournalism Now in Conversation. I'm Alison Stiven Taylor. In this interview, I'm chatting with James Whitlow Delano, an award winning photojournalist based in Japan. Welcome, James, and thanks so much for being part of this series. Thank you for having me. It's, it's really a pleasure to share these experiences with you. So I thought that we could start by talking about the fact that at the beginning of this year, you were in Antarctica. And I remember that you were talking about trying to get back to Japan because, of course, the coronavirus was then a global pandemic. Yes, it, I was in Antarctica at the end of February. And Remember, I, I live in Japan. We were already aware of the existence of COVID-19, but having been through SARS, my expectations of where this was going and everyone's expectations were far from where they are now. Suddenly, I found myself on the only continent without COVID. As time went on, people were starting to return. All the bases were closing and where I was happened to be where the airport was. And all these people were coming back telling nightmares about closing borders in Europe and, and so on. And I thought, well, I'll be here for another month. Uh, by the time we get back fr from the ship, everything will be okay. And that was not to be at all because but we were actually asked to leave the ship because Chile had declared a uh, state of emergency and that ship was a part of the Chilean Navy. Suddenly I found myself in Antarctica and not knowing how I would get home. And it was also a time to be perfectly honest with you. I wanted to be with my wife. I've had a lot of personal tragedy of when I was hearing about people being lock, locked up in ICU and they couldn't see their families. The last thing I ever wanted was for me to be 6,000, 8,000 kilometers away from home. So there began this odyssey to get back to Japan. James created a short video of his experience in trying to get back to Japan. So let's have a look at some of that footage. This is the story of a journey back from Antarctica to Tokyo in the time of COVID and a six week shutdown. Talking to you in Antarctica. Maybe you can hear the wind. Hurricane force out there. Uh, I was invited to come here by the Antarctic Institute of uh, Chile. Uh, what I'm doing now is waiting for a flight back out um, because we were supposed to go further south on a Chilean naval vessel. Um, and they very nicely asked us to get off because they didn't want to have any um, civilians or um, Chileans otherwise potentially infect them. Although, to be honest, the bigger threat was from them to us because uh, I myself have been here a month, coronavirus free, and they came from the mainland. Day three of the video diary, coronavirus here in Antarctica. Um, thought it'd be a good chance to talk about some of the hard and fast rules. You can see it's changed well and truly to winter. When you're here, you're not allowed to go outside alone. Um, and if you go, you need permission and you need a, to take a radio. Uh, reason being that there are no landmarks. Uh, the only land plants are moss, lichen, cyanobacteria, and two kinds of grass. So you get out in the desert-like landscape with no land, with uh, absolutely no landmarks and it's very very easy to get lost it was unlike any place i've ever been it was literally the closest thing you will ever do to be on another planet um all of the normal things we take for granted just simply don't exist there and and the the you look out on the islands and just see entire islands in a desert completely buried with ice it's just raw earth and ice uh, and very few humans you know, and we're we are we've never colonized that continent so you truly are in a place where humans cannot live that really makes you think about things and how fragile that place is as well yeah, i think the fragility of antarctica is something that is really top of mind for australia i mean it 
it is the last uh, bastion of, you know, relatively pristine uh, part of the planet, isn't it? It is. For photography, it was wonderful because of the minimalism of, of the landscape. To me, there's endless potential there, but it's also you know, fascinating to think how this um, affects the rest of the planet and what's happening down there, because the scientists who I was working with are seeing uh, changes that are profoundly important and affecting the oceans all over the world, because part of that ecosystem in Antarctica fuels all of the currents that uh, feed the Pacific, Indian, and Atlantic oceans. This photograph here with the red bull can, and we're going to talk about your project Drowning in Plastic shortly, but when I saw this picture, I thought, oh man, people are even leaving rubbish behind in Antarctica? That's what I thought. Uh, well, as you know, I have a long history of working in China, and there's a great litter problem there. Great Wall Station was less than 10 kilometers as the crow flies, and there's no doubt from the writing where that red bull came from. Um, but it was, yeah. It, what what does it take to uh, clean up after yourself? So that was locally generated trash. But, you know, all of our trash is, is still circulating and making its way down there as well. So let's leave the majestic wilderness of the Antarctica behind to talk about your long-term work on documenting the impact of plastic pollution around the world. The The method of working is something that I do often, and that is I'll have an idea of an issue I'm interested in. And when I travel, I'll see if I can add to it. But this, this story on plastic was, was born really in the Philippines. The first time I went to the Philippines was 1992. I, I love the country. It's incredibly beautiful and it's incredibly contaminated, let's say. It, it's got the extremes of rich and poor and beauty and horror. I would see places in the Philippines where you couldn't see the water, but for the plastic floating on top of it and started to photograph it, but also started to do research on the issue writ large on, for example, how 90, as much as 95% of the plastic in the ocean is microplastic in the ocean. So what we're seeing is a small fraction mm. of all the plastic that's actually out there. And also the South China Sea, just by chance, this is close to Japan and I've been documenting Borneo, um, in Malaysia, the Malaysian Borneo, Sarawak, for almost as long as I've been in, in uh, Asia, traveling throughout Southeast Asia, and I would see plastic, plastic, plastic. And it, as it turns out, the, the vast majority of ocean plastic comes into the South China Sea. And so you've got China, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia has a couple of islands, Natuna Islands, that are fringing the South China Sea, and Malaysia and Thailand are among the top 10 countries, just, you know, framing uh, the South China Sea. And then you add to that Bangladesh, I believe eight out of the top 10 ocean plastic contributors are Asian nations. India is not even in that top 10. And yet I don't know how, if the data is accurate because it is just about as bad as everywhere else. So you've got these rivers, you know, the, the Ganga River, the Mekong, uh, Chao Phraya from Thailand feeding into the South China Sea, and it's all feeding this plastic. The truth about plastic is that, well, first of all, it, it, like cancer, there's not one kind of cancer. There's not one kind of plastic, it's quite diverse. It, it is, we have to concede one of the greatest discoveries of humanity. It's hard, it's soft, it's pliable, it's rigid, it's heat resistant. It, it can be bent into any form, it's lightweight. But the problem is, is that it's so good we made so much of it and then we have to get rid of this stuff and it ends up in the environment and doesn't break down just into tiny, tiny pieces that end up in the marine ecosystem and zooplankton think it's food, they fill up their stomachs, it's toxic to them, they're dying off, and then it f makes its way up the food chain to us and also to the large marine mammals and animals in general. So it's this massive systemic problem of a very useful product. We need to find alternatives to it and viable recycling that everybody does. And that's, that's the challenge because the, you're looking at the problem. To me, what was particularly, uh, you know, telling was just all the places, the top of the Andes, you know, where you find 
plastic absolutely every in the rainforest on the beach in borneo in the rainforest i mm -hmm. mean it's it's just 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 humbling so this is in this is peru peru yeah that's at 5200 meters it's la riconada it's a kind of an artisanal mine it's the highest permanent human settlement on the planet and it has a climate change aspect because those houses that you see a glacier used to occupy that and they're just for the last 40 well they've been mining there actually since inca times but they've been following the receding glacier up the mountain. And the men who work there have nowhere to put their refuse. They're walking past it. You can see a pile there. And that's not the only place. I mean, you just see garbage piled everywhere. They work for 30 days for free. The 31st day, they work for themselves. So it's one step above slave labor. When I saw this photograph, high up in the andes i just it actually blew my mind i could not believe that there was that much plastic rubbish it's incredible i, I was looking for stories i was actually going to bolivia and i was looking for stories and i saw this this on the satellite you know the thing allison was it was such a beautiful place hmm. and the men there are really nice it's something that people who know me know this i'm from california so my second language is spanish and uh, I can get along a lot better in Latin America than I can even in Japan. So I'm very comfortable in Latin America. I like the people there, they're really kind people, great senses of humor, but there's poverty and there's racism. Most of the men who work in this mine are Quechua or uh, Aymara indigenous people at the bottom of the, you know, the social ladder, no opportunity. They can't make money uh, on livestock anymore. So they go up to the mine and they're they're just bathing in mercury. Mm. It's it's used to to purify the the gold in residential neighborhoods. It just goes up, hits the cold air, and all comes down. So you've got the plastic, you've got the environmental destruction, you've got the mercury poisoning, you've got the elevation, which doesn't affect them, granted, as much as us. But it's just this cocktail, and in all of this uh, water, all of this runoff runs down to Lake Titicaca, the big, beautiful freshwater lake that so many people in Bolivia and Peru are dependent upon for their drinking water. We have to give this message over and over to different audiences because people do quickly forget and different modes of communication have different penetrations into people's minds. Now, Visa for Limage, Jean-Francois Loa has been very supportive of my work for a very long time. I'm grateful to exhibit, you know, the physical photos uh, this time. This is a fantastic opportunity. Let's have a look at some of the personal work that you've been doing. You, this is part of your um, COVID-19 sort of self- Absolutely. Experience. This was two photographs, obviously, but to me, it communicates what I feel from them. Because the Batek are the rainforest, and the rainforests are the Batek. And Som in that photograph is just radiating. And, and you notice she has flowers in her hair, and they use waxy leaves and flowers for decorative purposes. And there's a calm, unshaking wisdom in her. Uh, and I feel like, you know, you can feel the rainforest is part of her sinew, documenting so literally for so long. I wanted to kind of get back to my roots and what I'm thinking. And I felt like uh, with this rainforest sentinels, I was able to communicate what I was feeling and perhaps what I felt was their world. This is a Panan man. He was the oldest man in the village. And his ah, uh, gentleness. You, know, you put me in the rainforest, you put him in the rainforest and he'll survive and thrive. I'll die. And yet he's got this humble nature. So I've learned so many uh, wonderful lessons about life and what's important from people I've met. Now he lives in Sarawak, Borneo, um, and his village, uh, Long Banali, is right below a mountain and the loggers have come in relentlessly all the way to the Malaysia border. He's up against it, also a, a national park. But there are still some uh, patches of undisturbed forests, some patches that could recover if they leave it alone. And the logging company basically says to them, you've got an airport out 
or this dirt road. And we will not maintain, if you want us to maintain the dirt road, uh, you have to let us come in and log. So they, they become dependent on the cash economy and logging almost becomes like an extortion that mm -hmm. they can't avoid anymore. Yeah. It's really interesting when I'm looking at this because I know the story of these people and I've watched the short film, but now I see these images in such a different artistic conversation. And I, I find them really meditative, really calming to look at. Thank you. I, I also find them quite a, emotional because their lives have been altered forever. You know, this, this woman is lucky. She lived in a long house that's um, above a dam. And so they don't want to log above the dam because the debris will clog up the hydroelectric turbines. And again, this is a Batek man laid over. One, uh, uh, this is a, uh, another park. Um, so you can get the view of what their world is like. And you do feel like people are watching you because, or th things, the forest itself is watching you because they can see and be unseen so easily. It's just so dense uh, in the rainforest, so full of life. Oh, I think this is really beautiful work. It's very, um, it, it does feel very spiritual. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, it's an important place to me. It really is. And it's, it's hard to communicate uh, what it is like in to be immersed in that environment and that that i think maybe speaks to it so let's have a chat about the last series of pictures the mangaland redux and i wondered if this is what you were talking about when you said you were sort of revisiting some of your street photography and you know revisiting sort of what you feel about japan japan is such a uh i have so many layers of um of uh, thought and influence on me. I've, I, I am a product of taking in a, we a Westerner and just dropping them in this completely different place. I've learned so much. One of the most lasting impressions and why this is called Mongoland, I had a fir first, I had a, just a straight street series, Japan Mongoland, uh, starting in the early 90s. And um, then I kind of just dropped it for a little while. I've always felt that Japan the one of the reasons why they have this wild imagination and manga is that their inner life is so rich because their outer life is concrete packed mass transit hectic schedules starting at elementary school and that the human soul and creativity is like putty and if you squeeze it in your hands no matter how hard you squeeze it it's going to start coming out between your fingers in most creative ways and i think that's manga it's this this human nature that refuses to be contained and people have amazing imaginations in japan and one of the things i say to my students is don't lose that don't try to do you know your impression of what you think westerners want we love you the way you are but this was my reaction to it and uh, i've just taken it a step further by creating uh, even a, a further step away from reality into how I feel Japan has affected me, but how my interpretation of the society. I also have another series of straight photos in, um, in color called Alone, because everybody seems to be in their own little private bubble. As with everything, uh, there's not one, just one way to interpret the stimuli. This is, again, uh, trying to dig a little bit deeper into the psyche about what Japan over these decades has meant to me as a outsider, you know, gaijin. Hopefully it, it reflects kind of a hybrid of my soul and the soul of Japan coming together. And what are you thinking? Are you thinking a, another book or a different kind of series for, for this more artistic strain? At some point, yes, uh, I'd, I'd like I, I'd like to experiment more with it, with some of the uh, work from China, some work from Africa, you name it, uh, just to see where I can take this. Um, I've put on hold a book on the U.S.-Mexican border. You can see that I'm a bit of a uh, got a, my hands in a lot of things, but that's an, I'm an old guy. I've I've been a lot of places. <laughs> I'm from San Diego, and the border of Mexico and U.S. is important to me. So that's on hold until after the uh covid passes but i hope to get back to that and all that would happen before i would consider a book but i think to be fair i take time 
with a series and a body of work. And I, 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 I this is new. It's, it, it's pulling on older work, but the whole way of expression is new. And I want to let it mature a little bit and produce more work and see where it goes to make sure that it's a, of a, a quality that is deserving of a book. But I, yeah, I see more of the conceptual work in the near term. Uh, and then when things start opening up, then you have to start asking yourself, uh, how comfortable are you at jumping right back in? You know, for example, um, you know, real world stuff. Um, I'd like to go to Cali California, West Coast and do the fires. United States, no health insurance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, no one's immune to COVID. So these are the, this, these are going to be the new layers of, you know, things we have to look at. Um, I'd be more comfortable going to Malaysia. No problem. So, uh, these are going to be the, 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 this is going to be the, uh, calculus that we're, we're, um, looking at. Um, do you want to go out into the middle of Borneo until you have a vaccine? So I think that these these are the new this is the new um landscape of the photojournalist and uh of all of us but particularly for somebody like me I like I like to get as far away as I can from what is uh, I know Antarctica Borneo rainforest the Sahara uh, and now we have to rethink that and I'm not a germaphobe by nature. I, I, you can see from the the garbage uh, uh, dumps that I've worked in uh, with the plastic series. I'm not afraid of bi and microbes, but this is a different thing. So we have to rethink mm. um, uh, what is um, well, what's life all about, but also what is uh, what is doable. Mm. It's been great to look inward. I'm doing things that I never had time to do before. So hopefully we can share other parts of our, our lives with people. Thank you so much for making time to talk and be part of the series. It's really terrific to have you involved. It's a, it's a pleasure and I'm kind of honored in very good company. So thank, <laughs> thanks a lot, Alison. I really appreciate it. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm.